It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Brandon Riff. Thank you so much for coming by. Thanks for having me. So I'm down here in South Phoenix. He's up there in um, Scottsdale. So Brandon Riff grew up in Tempe, Arizona, which is about 10 minutes from here, and attended the University of Arizona. That's kind of weird that you're in Tempe and went to U of A. Yeah. Um, that's what we call out here. Um, all the kids around Tempe, they want to get away from their parents. They go to U of A. And all the kids in Tucson want to get away from their parents. They go to ASU. Uh, I noticed my uh, three of my four kids went to uh, NAU uh, to get, have a ski pass uh, for college. And then he attended the University of Arizona, where he graduated with dual degrees in physiology from the College of Medicine and molecular and cellular biology from the College of Science. Upon graduation, Dr. Riff then attended the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. After dental school, Dr. Riff became an associate in a small group of privately owned dental practices in Arizona. Subsequently, this group was approached and acquired by a national DSO backed by private equity investors. This transition was a complex process that Dr. Riff found very interesting. Watching his father-in-law successfully serve as the president and CEO of a multi-billion dollar international corporation only further fueled Dr. Riff's interest in business and executive leadership. Accordingly, Dr. Riff then completed a two-year business program, earning a professional graduate certificate in strategic management from Harvard University Extension School. Alongside completing his business program and practicing dentistry, Dr. Riff was also appointed Vice President of Business Development within the private equity DSO group that made that had acquired the practice he worked at. Dr. Riff was involved in multiple acquisitions made by the DSO from 2013 to 2015, during which time the company ranked number 14 for the Inc. 500's fastest growing companies in America. Are you allowed to say the name of it? Yeah, it was uh, Dynamic Dental Partners. Dynamic Dental Partners. Yep. A drastic shift in executive leadership and corporate strategy at the DSO prompted a strategic transition for Dr. Riff himself. In August 2016, Dr. Riff left the corporate private environment and acquired a private practice in Paradise Valley, Arizona. During the first year, Dr. Riff applied knowledge he had gained from his tenure in business development and business school to create a unique team environment. After hearing through social media of a themed Team Unity lunch, held in good fun to help mend wounds of the 2016 post-election divide, the Washington Post featured an article about the unique atmosphere and team at Dr. Riff's practice. Among many factors, the leadership management lessons Dr. Riff acquired through his work and educational experiences contributed to a 33% growth in his new practice during the first year. Behind the scenes, Dr. Riff negotiated improved terms with suppliers, vendors, and labs with whom he had previously established positive relationships. On the front line, Dr. Riff focused on leadership and worked to build a culture of positivity and appreciation. With the simple mission of providing clinical excellence and uncompromising service, Dr. Riff rallied an exceptional team of focused, motivated, and accomplished professionals to take the practice to the next level. To reward their hard work and dedication, Dr. Riff also implemented a unique bonus program, which resulted resulted in pay increases of 24% on average for each employee. The combined result of applied strategic management principles, his consistent focus on positive leadership, and implementing a generous employee bonus program was a 75% increase in profit dollars for his first year as owner in 2017. The journey for Dr. Riff and his team was not without some turbulence though. Months after becoming the new owner, Dr. Riff learned that his landlord had suddenly passed away, leaving the entire property to charity. A big commercial real estate developer made intentions made clear that the plan was to demolish and redevelop the property. Accordingly, Dr. Riff found a new location to continue the 60-year legacy of the practice. With the unwavering support of his loyal team and their active participation in all levels of the process, Dr. Riff and team built a brand new state-of-the-art facility, which will serve to take the practice well into the next generation. So do, are you, uh, do you remember an endodontist out there in Paradise Valley named Joe Dufkin? No. no. Ah, that was my uh, roommate at Creighton. And a hell of a guy, and uh, he was uh, he he left the planet Earth way too early. Um, he got the same thing as um, Sam Walton got of Walmart. But uh, so uh, my gosh, what an outstanding uh, journey! So first, so first, I want to go to the beginning. Um, so I'm old enough to be your dad. You're 32. I'm 55. That means I could have had you at age 23. So when I was your age, Orthodontic Centers of America. On the New York Stock Exchange, billion dollar valuation, a dozen on NASDAQ, they all imploded, they're all gone. Then you didn't hear about them for a decade, now they're all back. But the red flag to me is that um, none of them could go public. I mean, imagine this, 
Imagine I go on Shark Tank and I go to Cuba and, and Mr. Wonderful, I like Mr. Wonderful the most, the, the bald, beautiful one. You know which one that is? Yeah. yeah. And I said, um, <laughs> I said, uh, Brandon, Riff, Mr. Wonderful, I, w I want a million dollars. And he said, what are you going to do with it? I said, well, I'm going I'm to buy a dental office. And then what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to come back next week and ask for another million and buy another dental office. Then what are you going to do? I'm just going to come back every week and after 50 weeks, I'll bill my sales to 50 million. Well, Mr. Wonderful would say, well, how am I going to get my money back? Now you have 50 million of debt. I just see them rolling up existing practices and their sales and debt grows at the same. And if any of them could do an IPO, they would, but it seems like they're just flipping them from private equity that specializes in five to 10 million. And then they throw, then they flip that to some private equity does 50 million, a hundred million. Why can't these guys go public? And, um, and do you, do you think, um, do you think it's a good business, the, the current business models they do? I think that the uh, current business model has its place in the market. Um, you can't, fool the statistics, which are that the uh, DSO model is growing at a rate that's roughly double what um, the private practice model is growing. Um, fortunately for us, that rate itself is um, also double what GDP is projected to uh, increase over the next five years. Can I say that again? So DSOs, DSOs are growing twice the rate of... So it'd be 12, about 12% 12 GDP is 3% um, and then the private practitioner, uh, about 6%. Okay. So it's a positive outlook um, for us. Now, those are all projections. And how do you exactly define growth? Because a lot of these private companies keep their balance sheets uh, you know, under wraps. So um, I, I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, transferring of these assets, as you mentioned, from one private equity firm to another, and I think that uh, um, I've always thought it was uh, kind of a bubble waiting to, to burst, um, because the, the whole premise of the DSO was um, you can centralize your uh, non-clinical operations, and you have marketing, and you have HR, and you have um, uh, accounting uh, all centralized, and you are able to have one central hub serve uh, various uh, practices um, across the country in many cases uh, and only have to pay for uh, one accountant. And they have more than one accountant, but the point is that you don't have to have all of those positions at each location. Uh, so there were a lot of predictions that this would result in increased efficiencies, uh, reduced expense. Um, but I, I don't think that that's actually what ends up happening um, based on what I've seen and how that type of model um, actually functions. What uh, my experience was, um, before I say that, I want to make a distinction between the large DSO groups and let's say a, a small group of five to 10 offices that's you know, all focused in let's say Phoenix area versus a large DSO that it's across the country. Um, the, the, the problem is, is that there's always, due to the culture, there's always a lot of turnover in these positions. And it's almost like they can't get any traction because they're always starting out from square one again when someone else comes in. Um, and I, I don't think uh, these, these jobs can be centralized to the point where, um, um, dentists in their own offices are getting the same level of attention uh, if they had their own accountant. So I've got my own bookkeeper and he comes in every other Monday and he makes uh, my life very, very easy. He pays all the bills, takes care of things, you know, does the W-2 stuff, 1099 stuff, all, all the things that I don't want to do. Um, but he actually gets it done. Um, DSOs, part of their value proposition to um, other dental practices that are thinking of being acquired by DSO or being managed by DSO. Um, it's always let us take care of the business stuff and uh, all the headaches and hassles of running the business and you can spend more time with your patients. And it's a great thought. Um, I, I don't see that in the, in the case of the large uh, nationwide DSO model 
that that actually happened. I actually feel that uh, a lot of my time was spent undoing problems, solving problems that were created by the, the large bloated management structure of the DSO. And uh, it, it kept me uh, away from my patients. And it, uh, it was frustrating and uh, it uh, came close to burning me out, honestly, as a dentist. So um, that was once it became national and, and large and not run by a dentist. Um, that, that's when I, I started to see that the efficiencies aren't, aren't really there. So uh, what that ties into to answer your question, uh, these lack of efficiencies and the lack of the theory becoming a reality uh, is that these uh, dental practices aren't all that profitable. And I, I, have, I can't give specific details, but I, I have seen the, the numbers, at least with the group, that I was at and, and how the numbers were impacted uh, going from a state-run DSO to then becoming acquired and being run by a nationwide DSO, they became less profitable. And so it's, uh, it, it's, tough. it's tough with that model to do well long term. Um, eventually, um, the, the investors get tired of not winning and they have to uh, answer to their investors, and um, luckily they've got diversified portfolios to make up for the losses. But uh, a lot of these DSOs came in and, and uh, overpaid for a lot of the practices that they acquired, and then were not ready from an operational standpoint to run the practices uh, to the level uh, that, that they were being run prior to any of those acquisitions and they miss the key component, which is that you're not buying a practice, it's the doctor, it's a doctor. So um, I think there were a lot of cases, and they're getting smarter now, but there were a lot of cases where they would acquire a practice and the doc was ready to just cut and run. And they take the money, leave, and then so would the patients and so would the investment. So um, it, it's the value proposition from the uh, DSO to everyone else is we're going to make this run smoothly, you're going to do great, uh, and, you're, and we're going to make more money because of that. And I just, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's what actually happens. Man, you are wise behind your years. You sound like you're 62. <laughs> Thanks. No, I, I'm serious. I mean, I just want to review some of the deals. Um, huge, largest red flag. None of them are profitable. If they were profitable, they would go public. They cannot go public. Right. Number two, there were only about three major banks funding these guys, and East West Bank pulled out of it. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yep. And why did they pull out of it? They pulled out of it because the offices weren't able to make good on their payments. And they had losses. Cases. Yeah. The banks were losing money. Mm -hmm. Number two, you said something very profound. The large DSOs have two layers of management. What you said was so genius where when I go into small markets in uh, North or South Dakota or, or in, in Arizona, say, say you're in a town of um, say half a million and you have one office. Well, if you go from um, one office in the South and then go to one North and one East and one West, now you have all these scales of efficiencies for marketing and advertising and all that stuff. And those guys really do do well. But when you wrap up all these different states with another layer of management at headquarters, who wants 14, 15, 16% off the top, there's nothing those guys do to justify their wages. So one layer of management um, I see has been profitable, but affording a second layer, crazy, doesn't work. Uh, the other thing you said was, um, you know, there's, there's two ways we're gonna get profitable. One is we're just gonna get more efficient, we're gonna save money on supplies and lab and all that. But let's say you get your overhead uh, to a dollar a day, or a dollar a year. Well, if you do a dollar in sales, your overhead's 100%. But if you get to two dollars in sales, now your overhead's fifty percent. You could only save so much money. You really start making probability when you keep increasing production. But they don't really get increase in production because of their employee turnover. And it's not just DSOs; it's 
associates in private practice and it's associates in the most coveted Fortune 500 companies. I read a big deal on um, uh, employee turnover with Thing. Um, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Microsoft have him, millennials last between one and two years. Apple was actually the lowest at about a year and Facebook was the best. So they're giving them money, stock options, foods tables, fun places to work, and these millennials don't stay. So I hope you listen to this because about 25% of our podcasters send me an email, howard at dentaltown.com and tell me um, where you, uh, um, how old you are, where you're from, all that kind of stuff. A quarter of them are, are millennials. 95% are under 30. I get like one old guy a week that says it's older, but um, they're all told, these DSOs all go in there and say, private practice is dying, we're gonna take over within 10 years, half the nest will be working for us, you can't compete with us, all this doom and gloom, so you better join us now. But if that was true, all these DSOs have been out for decades. Um, nobody stays. So you can fantasize that, oh, I'm just gonna get out, I'm just gonna get a job and live happily ever after, but it doesn't happen. So you're gonna have to, um, I, my, my advice, I, I skipped all the steps. I graduated May 11, um, drove to Phoenix, it took uh, from Kansas City to Phoenix, uh, it took uh, almost two days, and I had my office open September 21st. And people say, well, were you ready? Well, no, I'm not ready, but it, it's like swimming lessons when you, I threw four boys one at a time into the deep end of a swimming pool. And guess what? They're all alive. They all learned how to swim. They, you know, it's just, just better now than ever. Or, or do you recommend that they go to a DSO for a couple of years? I think, um, again, it depends on if it's a, a, a national one, which I do not recommend. If it's a local um, group where you've got five, ten offices and, and one owner who's, you know, it's, I, I think that uh, for me, it was a great opportunity to learn the business, pick up on you know uh, additional procedures that I wasn't comfortable with, and um, they gave me a job when no one else would. Um, offered me training, and um, um, I, I learned. And you just said something profound. They offered you a job when no one else would, mm -hmm. and I find it very jaded when all these older dentists are on Dental Town whining about DSOs. And it's like, dude, your office is closed Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You're not offering employment. Mm -hmm. they, they, they could come in. You don't even know how many times you had an incoming call uh, f from Thursday at 5 to Monday at 8. And, I mean, if you just had them sitting in there with an assistant, I mean, I mean, say, say you paid them a $400 minimum day or a $500 minimum day. One broken tooth and a crown, there's 1000 mm -hmm. One toothache, root canal crown, there's 2000 um, the convenience, you know, the uh, uh, whatever, you know. Yeah, and, and so with that being so, said. So, and thank you to the DSOs for providing yeah. jobs, because when I got out of school, the only ones that were providing my roommates who weren't ready to dive in the deep end was the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. And nobody badmouthed that. Nobody said, oh, they're, you know, blah. nobody badmouthed that. So why are they badmouthing DSOs when um, our colleagues need employment? Yeah, so I think that it, it all comes down to, to one key element and that's people. When I was employed by a small group in Arizona, they treated me well, honestly. They, they, uh, they did treat me well. It uh, was when it became national and when dentists weren't involved in running it anymore that um, it was clear what the objective was and the objective was make money above anything else. Um, uh, the problem with the model um, that, that the uh, national DSOs try to uh, operate is that they assume all of these practices are the same. You can cookie cutter them. You can treat them all the same. You can manage them all the same. Um, they all have the same needs. They all respond to management in the same way. Uh, and it misses the, the fact that um, management's not always the best solution. Uh, a lot of times it's leadership. And one of the key components of leadership is um, being ethical, um, being consistent, being fair, um, um, helping people, having a, a noble cause. And when you're missing uh, check marks in all those boxes, it becomes problematic. These and, and all those things you said are unmeasurable foofaw, right? Because I mean, when you take ethics, when I was your age, if you got caught drinking beer and whiskey, the cops just laughed. But if you're caught marijuana, you were in jail. Now marijuana is legal. 
um, gay marriage, you know, when I was little. Um, I mean, people would walk out of, I mean, I, I remember several times leaving Catholic Church and kids joking that they went to parks the night before and beat up fags. Yeah. So, and then ethics and dentistry. You have um, even, it's more art than science. Like you have dentists who their whole passion and mission is removing everybody's toxic mercury amalgam and replacing it with composites. Or I would say that and say, well, the amalgam will last 38 years, this inner plastic will last six years. And they're saying, well, the mercury is toxic. Well, it's bond insoluble to silver, zinc, copper, tin. You swallow an amalgam, you poop it out 24 hours later. Um, but they eat shrimp and lobster that's filled with ethyl yep. and methyl mercury. And then where you went to U of A was where I was educated and brought to life on mercury toxicity. I went down there. This guy published, and I went down there and talked to him. This is like 30 years ago, and he was an old dude there. But he was taking um, fetal premature babies, abortions, what have you, and he was looking at um, mercury toxicity. And he said, it's, it's all seafood. And there was a ton of research that made all the way to the CDC, and they got all the way to where they wanted to put a warning label on seafood for pregnant women. But our politicians stopped that. So when you're, so the ethics of, I'm gonna remove your toxic amalgams when I'm eating seafood, lobster, and shrimp. And uh, so, so all, all that is so, uh, you know, so, oh, and, and the other thing is the, 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 the six successful dentist, uh, some of these kids get out of school, they build million dollar practices, they got passionate about one thing like implants or sleep apnea or cosmetic dentistry or Invisalign. So these DSOs that think they're gonna stamp out a million Model T Fords and everyone is gonna be black, I mean, my guy, it's just crazy. And, and that's where a lot of dental divorces come in because you and I are friends in school, we're buddies, we get married and we have a dental office and I wanna go off into sleep apnea and TMJ and you're like, dude, bring it home, let's, let's go this direction and you know, so, so yeah, that, that dentist, so, um, if you want a cookie cutter and build a large military, what does the military want? They want young boys under 25. They don't want a bunch of boys over 50 and um, um, hurting dentists, physicians and lawyers like hurting cats. They all got a mind of their own. That's true. And the ones that are gonna go out there and take several hundred hours of CE and master like implants or sleep apnea or ortho or TMJ or whatever, they're not gonna work for corporate. So people are just going in there doing time for a year or two and then getting out. Yep. Would you agree? I would agree, yeah. yep. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right, uh, right, right. Uh, the markets. I think, yeah, people need to put themselves in the best situation for themselves that's certainly I mean, I mean look, look at cars and housing so. I mean the um, the biggest expense you'll ever pay in your life is taxes but the second biggest expense you'll ever pay is your house third your car and look at housing I mean here in Arizona you can go a trailer one bedroom two bedroom all the way to a 15 bedroom look at cars you can take the bus you can get a used car you can take a Chevy for all the way to a Lamborghini and that's the way dentistry will be There'll be many, many markets, and neither of them are right or wrong. They're just markets serving people. Yep, yep. I think um, if DSOs want to get serious about um, actually managing effectively, they need to get down in the trenches and understand the actual needs of their practices. Because I think, uh, at least for me, the perception was always, why are we watering the garden while the house is on fire? You know, So they would be... Uh, focused on some project that uh, didn't help our day-to-day -day operation and if you want to gain credibility with the people that you're supporting I mean, it's in the it's in the word DSO dental support organization then the people need to feel supported and that means that um, um, their problems are, are solved or um, their jobs are made easier that's what people want is they want a smooth operation they want their day to go well without surprises, without problems that uh, you know they can't solve or that make them have a bad day. One of the neat things that you did though, that none of my homies are really any chances, you worked for a DSO and were involved in multiple acquisitions made from 2013 to 2015, which I'm sure made you buying a practice a very knowledgeable person. What, what do you think all these kids, um, what, what, what could you share with them that they're never gonna have the experience of being on a dental office acquisition DSO team for two years before they go buy their first practice. 
or maybe the, by their only practice. Yeah, so uh, I, I would say that um, you got to look at what you're really buying uh, outside of just the number. Uh, on uh, some profit loss statement, it means nothing. You need to look at the uh, um, objective facts, of course. You got to know what money is there, but you also, more, more importantly, I'd argue, you need to look at um, what made those numbers happen. One of the key indicators, in my view, uh, to uh, whether you're looking at a, a good dental practice with a good dentist. Uh, it's not the online reviews because you can, in my view, you can manipulate those and, and uh, uh, kind of pay your way. Uh, uh, it's, is their team happy? Is their team motivated? Are they focused? Are they uh, gathered uh, around and, and supporting a, a central uh, mission? Do they have uh, enthusiasm when they come to work. How long has their hygienist been there? And none of these are on a balance sheet number. No. And, but, but the accountants painstakingly, well, how much is that cabinet worth? Yeah. And what's it depreciate? Or when did you get this equipment? And what's the replacement? It's like the equipment, the replacement cost. Okay, this office has two hygienists. They've both been there 12 years. And this office has two hygienists. And one's been there two years. And one's been there six months. And they've had a different one, at, you know. And then those, those aren't even on the balance sheets, are they? No. But again, it goes back to the cookie cutter argument where these guys think that just because one year it did two million, that the next year it's going to do two million. Uh, and they don't look at all of the factors that contributed to that happening the year that it happened. Uh, if you lose key players, you are not going to do the same thing that you did the year prior. It's, and who are key players? Key play, well, there are a lot of them. Uh, the, every single member of the team, in my view, is a key player. Um, the, the patient is a key player. So when you're looking at um, evaluating a business, you need to understand the patient base that is attached to the practice as well as the systems that are in place, the, the culture of the practice. Um, um, it's, it's a lot more than what uh, corporate is focused so much on running report. They want to run reports. They would rather run reports and look at profit loss statements and, and it, it's numbers, 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 numbers. I would rather, and what I'd recommend to anyone uh, listening and thinking about buying a practice would be um, ask questions to the people that are involved in making everything happen. Um, ask them if they're happy, ask them if they uh, need anything, ask them if uh, uh, there's anything you can do to help them. When they see that uh, your, your priority is to help them succeed and to support them and to give them the tools that they need to be successful, um, that's, it, it's invaluable. You can't, you can't get better than that. But uh, the numbers, they're, they're focused on the result. The numbers tell you what's already happened. Um, it's too late by that point. It's so obvious to dental students when they're looking at the Phoenix Suns, and the Phoenix Suns has five players. It was so obvious to me um, a dozen years ago when, uh, Char when, they, when they let Charles Barkley go. It's like, what? I mean, isn't he like the whole team? <laughs> um, and you said everybody's the whole team. I mean, if Charles Barkley throws the ball to you and you don't catch it and it goes out of bounds. I mean, everybody is critical. And um, the dentist, um, they take HR the least serious and it's the most important. Right. If you ask, if you ask questions, people will tell you if you're willing to listen. I mean, I, I love uh, various quotes and I'm not very good at uh, citing them, but uh, one of them that I, I try hard to, to keep in mind is uh, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You're supposed to listen uh, twice as much as you talk. And uh, I really try to uh, employ that in my office. And I, so uh, another, another thing on purchasing, um, a lot of them think there's rule of thumbs that you know they sell for one year's gross. Um, some, um, I know that um, practices are more liquid in the urban big cities than they are in rural. I mean, in my 30 years, I've watched um, Dennis and Towns of 5,000 put their office up for sale, but after two or three years and then a heart attack later, just closed the doors. I mean, it was an illiquid asset. Um, um, were you, did you find yourself in a bidding war? I mean, were there like several offers on this practice or was yeah. it competitive or not really? So 
that was then, and, and now it's not this way. Just so okay. You know, so what year was that? We were doing all that 13, 14, um, 2015. Mm -hmm. um, back then, the competitive advantage that we had um, would be we didn't have to go through uh, a qualification period with a bank and take a month to fund. We could push a button and boom, done. Now we had a process. We had a pipeline, uh, acquisition pipeline that we would uh, work on every day. We would do our due to due diligence, but uh, we could act quickly, a lot quicker than anyone else could. And uh, it, it's not its not that they had more money, because their objective was to try to build value uh, right out the gate by paying as little as possible for the, uh, the practice. And they would try to build in um, uh, value with the dentist that was selling um, by um, setting up an arrangement where the purchase price actually could increase um, based on their performance over the first, uh, second, or third year um, that would tie the dentist to uh, the practice for a couple of years and, and help with uh, the transition and, and uh, it would give them an opportunity to um, earn out uh, additional money. And that's not something that uh, banks do for it, just a, a regular guy. See, I'm already turning into one of those grouchy old farts where it's always better back in the old day, you know. But back in the old day, um, the owner would always carry the note for the young dentist. So, you know, you buy, um, well, I've seen out here in Phoenix for 30 years, um, one of the biggest mistakes I've seen is some dentist is doing $800,000 a year, a really nice practice, maybe a million dollars a year, um, but he places all his own implants, does all of his own wisdom teeth removal, does all his molar endo. And the kid that buys it doesn't have any of those skills and wants to be a cosmetic dentist. Yep. And they go buy a million dollar practice and in two years, the, the, I mean, the first year, the revenue goes from like a million a year to like 400 a year. So they didn't have the skills. And then number two, a lot of dentists, there was hidden problems with the office that weren't really disclosed. Um, I've seen in oh, small yeah. towns where um, through his own patients knew that the big factory was gonna um, go to Mexico, you know what I mean? Yep. So they sell it to some young kid, some other bank finances it in another state, and then he's not even there 18, 24 months, and the town of 5,000 has one factory that employs 500 and it shuts down. Um, but when the owner carried, then if I thought I had an upset patient, I, I, I could call him up and say, you know, your patient you've had for 20 years, he's really mad at me. Well, let me talk to him, you know what I mean? And that guy would be at the, um, when he's going to church and buying groceries and all that stuff, everybody, oh my God, I'm so glad I saw that guy. He's just got out of school, he knows all the latest stuff. He's the best guy he can find it. So the owner, Carrie, I really like, and that's pretty much gone. Yeah. But I think you yeah. can still find it because I'll, t I'll tell you why I think you can find it. One thing you recognize when you're 55 is that you start recognizing patterns. You don't understand right or wrong or what caused it or you don't always know. But like like I when I graduated from high school, the market crashes, 21% interest rate, double digit inflation and, and, uh, and Paul Volcker came in from the Fed. Um, I got out May 11, 87, September 87, Black Monday. Um, then I lived through the uh, March uh, 2000 internet bubble crash, and I just, I just, um, uh, 10 years ago, it's that 2008 meltdown. I smell meltdown again because I see this pattern every decade, and I see it all over the place right now. So if a dentist has a bunch of money in his stocks, and he's thinking, my God, that could really go down, and then bonds, what, what are bonds paying these days? Two, three percent? Yeah. And then you said, hey, doc. You, you, you sell me this $750,000 uh, office and you carry it for seven years at 10%. That old man's gonna be thinking 10%. I can't get 10% on a bond. And on my stock portfolio, I'm just worried about, I just don't wanna lose 10, 20%. I think right now a lot of young kids could go, and, and especially in rural where there's illiquid, not to mention the, the supply and demand ratios. I was in Irvine, California yesterday and uh, lecturing and uh, Ryan was there. We had three different dentists who really wanted to practice in Irvine and they can't find Irvine. The city of Irvine has a dentist for every 500 people. And it's like, dude, you know, you, why don't you live in Irvine? Because if you commuted an hour out down a two lane highway, you could find an area that had a dentist for every two or 3,000 people. Sure. 
Were you afraid of going in Paradise Valley? No, I wasn't afraid. Um, I was excited. Uh, I was a little nervous, and that's natural. But um, one thing that made me feel good, and this is what I, I hope uh, young dentists and, and dental students will we'll hear is that uh, going through the process to get a loan with, uh, from the bank, there's, there's a certain level of security there. This is my opinion on it. Banks are actually pretty good at evaluating risk. And uh, one huge red flag is if the bank uh, will not give you 100% financing. Now this is right now, I mean the markets change and all that, but if they won't give you 100% financing, that means that in their view, it's not worth that. And if they were to assign a, uh, a debt service to something that isn't justified by what they see uh, in the asset, then uh, it's risk. It's risk, and it's risk that they're not willing to take. And you might take that as uh, a warning that maybe you ought not to do it. And what people do, and what I've seen, and you brought it up, is the owner carry back, is the owner will say, Okay, the the bank's only going to give seven hundred, but the price is a million. I want a million. I'll carry back the three hundred thousand dollar loan. It's it's uh, I'm not saying it's wrong, but um, dentists that are wondering, gosh, is this a good deal? Is this going to make sense? Am I making a big mistake? Is this too risky? Is this going to fail? I think you can rest assured that the banks do a better job than uh, the the private equity folks. Because they're not emotional. Yeah, and, and they're going to go in there and they're going to actually um, um, look to uh, evaluate risk that's going to be tied to whether or not someone's actually going to pay. Um, the private equity DSO guys, you know, when we go in and we would buy these offices, this was a, a conversation I had with the business development team and we actually got in a pretty heated discussion about it. I see business development as being... Uh, yes, of course, we're doing acquisitions. That's the external part of it. I grow them on the inside as well. So I had a fundamental objection to going around and buying up all these offices and then uh, just taking, taking off, just let them, let them do whatever they're going to do. I felt that uh, we, should, we have a responsibility to monitor and evaluate the practices that we acquired and to make sure that these practices were succeeding and that our acquisition um, was adding to the bottom line. If it was losing money, how is that helpful to go and buy all of these assets that are losing money? In the because when they're out buying the assets, that's exciting. They're doing deals, they're closing deals, they're going home and popping champagne, they're doing deals. That's the emotional side of that game, but that's a big inside stock tip when um, you're looking at his company stock and they say, well, the sales grew 25%. Yeah, that's because they opened up 25 new restaurants. But then you need to go back and look at same store growth. Mm -hmm. And then same store growth is going down four, five, six, seven percent So they're buying this restaurant or opening up for a dollar and a year later, it's only 95 cents. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going down. And uh, so uh, that's uh, so um, being a uh, astute as you were, were uh, what practice management software did you go with? Uh, Dentrix. You went with Dentrix? Yeah, I, I, I really don't care so much for Dentrix, and I know a lot of people don't, but it's what was there, it's what the, the team knows how to use, and it, it does get the job done. Um, it's got some bugs, but uh, that was the, the software that. I was comfortable with and so I was fine with it. Um, a lot of these kids think that um, consumers are very impressed with high ticket items. Like if, uh, if I come in, I don't know if you're any good, but if you mill your own crowns, you must be better. If you have a 3D, $100,000 CBCT, you must be better. If you have a $100,000 millennial laser, you must be better. In your DSO market, did you see a correlation between buying these high dollar tickets and increase productivity and net income and profit or not, not a correlation? Well, I, I didn't see a correlation because I didn't see that uh, capital expenditures was part of the plan. Um, one of the things the DSOs say about themselves is, yeah, we'll take care of the management, you spend time with patients, but they say we leverage our, uh, uh, our strength in numbers to reduce costs and we pass that on to the patient. 
No, it gets passed on to the investors. And uh, I didn't see that any of that was taken and diverted uh, to, to buying these expensive high, high dollar items like uh, CEREC and Cone Beam and all that stuff. Um, so I, I didn't see a correlation now in my own practice. Um, we already had that stuff, so I, I don't have anything to compare it to, but I, I know uh, as, as it was in the bio that um, one year we had it and we had a certain uh, revenue level and then the next year we still had it, but it, it jumped. 33 percent. We didn't we didn't buy any big ticket items. We didn't start using these any more than we were using them before. It, it's it's um, focusing on the human part of it. So there's no way you can't buy yourself out of this. You can't. You have to get in there and and do your hard work the good old fashioned way. Treat people well. Provide a quality. And, and where can they learn this? Where, where did you learn it? I learned uh, a lot of it from trial and error and, and, and failing over and over and over um, prior to buying my practice. I learned what didn't work um, uh, to motivate um, my team. I, I learned what didn't work to get patients um, uh, to want to come back to the practice. Um, and, and I watched the failures uh, around me and, and took note and, and tried to um, implement it in my day to day uh, without actually having made that, those mistakes. And then formally I, I did the, uh, it was to a point where I, I felt I needed additional training and that's why I went and did the business uh, school uh, for a couple of years. And, and Harvard I, Business Extension? Mm -hmm. what, what, Harvard what does Extension that mean? School. So Harvard it's, Extension it's their, School. It's their school of uh, continuing education, and um, it is something that you can do uh, online uh, live webcast. Um, you appear telephonically, um, and some people are um, in the same state as you. Um, there are some people that were on the other side of the country, but uh, it was a hybrid. Program where Did you go from home? Yeah, so I would I would leave work a little early and I'd go and and it's about two hours a couple days a week, and um, there's a professor and there's a lecturer and you can push a button and raise your hand and you know you can. So you did all this from your home mm -hmm. with a uh, on your own computer with a uh, webcam. Webcam and then the other part of it was you did have to go. Um, uh, and, and appear in in uh, person in Cambridge, for, Massachusetts. Yeah, so you have to do that. Uh, I, I went down there, I think three different times, and it's like a. So it was five, a two-year program. Yeah. And what was the degree called? Uh, well, it's a certificate program. Um, so it's uh, strategic management was the strategic the, management. Uh, and do you recommend it? Highly recommend it. It's, and what it, it what did it cost? Uh, it wasn't bad. I think it was about fifteen thousand total. The whole thing for two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and that's my a, my. If you study my career, my inflection point was when I did my two year MBA night school. It was Monday and Wednesday nights from six to ten, and we did a lot of telephonic stuff with um, sometimes um, um, the instructor would be at U of A in Tucson. And it's pretty neat. They had a big screen, and I felt like I was just in the class. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I raised my hand. Yeah. I'm looking at her at a screen, and she'd say, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it's a total game changer. Oh, yeah. It's, it's one of the, the best things I've ever done, the best decisions I've ever made. I'll, I'll give you another analogy. It's like, it's like if your dental assistant's worked for 10 years, you're thinking, well, she knows how to do a root canal filling here, and she's been assisting you for 10 years. Well, it's just really different going to dental school. And a lot of people, dentists, they think, well, I'm, I'm a dentist, I do root canals. I, I get marketing and advertising, and I, I get all this stuff. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. uh, there's nothing like the formal. Right. And I tell dentists all the time, you're getting your butt kicked in business, go back to school. And I, I actually loved it. In fact, I, I was so sad when the ASU deal was over because every Monday and Wednesday night, it was, it was two classes a trimester. So six to eight would be one class and 8 10 be another class. And every trimester, you got two new classes, and it was uh, six trimesters over two years with the same 200 people. And the evening program isn't a bunch of kids, you know. Um, God, there was, um, you, know, you know, the famous Sheriff Joe. Yeah. There's a couple of people that work for him. The Eddie Bash's grocery store. There's a couple that work for him. 
every company you can think of in, in Arizona, Intel, Motorola, Microsoft, all these companies, and hanging out with those guys, talking shop, you started realizing there wasn't a lot of difference between dentistry and donuts and groceries and, and even uh, a government operation like Sheriff Joe. You're still managing people and time and processes and budgets. Maybe you get your money from customers, they get their, you know, but it was like a two year deal. And when it was over, it was sad. I mean, it was sad. Um, I just thought to myself, you know, what are you gonna do Monday night? I had to go back to Monday night football. Yeah. When I, and for the first year when I was watching Monday night football, I thought I'd rather be sitting in that classroom, you know, with uh, those people. It, it was really cool. You just, just go do it. And they got a Saturday program too. Mm -hmm. You just every Saturday eight to five for two years. Yeah, I I really uh, recommend doing that. I think if you go in there and try to get something out of it and understand the differences between management and leadership, understand that management is uh, here's another quote: management is getting people to do things right. Leadership's getting people to do the right things. And uh, you understand that um, there's a people process behind a number process. Um, most of that program was uh, about leadership. They had some core management courses, and you, you know, you know the strategy and numbers and, and, and all that. But that's not the major factor in whether or not you're going to be successful in business. It's about whether you can get people motivated to support your cause. And and uh, the the program was case based, so they would show you different scenarios, things that happen, and where uh, different leaders failed and what they did to turn things around. But uh, the, the whole idea that, that you can just uh, analyze your way out of these problems looking at spreadsheets, it just doesn't make much sense and it's not what I've found in, in uh, my practice. Um, in management, uh, what's the goal? You're going to get someone to comply with the policy. You know, when you lead people and you uh, get them excited, they're, they're going to do more than comply. They're going to embrace it. They're going to support it. And um, you're going to be much more successful in, in doing that. I think management is more like sticks. Like, well, if you're late, I'm going to write you up. And if right. you're late three times, I'm going to fire you. And if you do good, I'll give you an extra carrot. I'll give you a, I'll give you a bonus, a nickel. And I think true leadership is when you can create, make people want to do the right thing. And, sure. and there's so many different views and theories on leadership. One, one trick I have on leadership is that, because um, um, you might have a different personality. For instance, remember, remember that Indiana Hoosiers coach who threw a chair at a boy and they got rid of one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time? Okay, first of all, um, you don't know what leadership style that guy needed. Um, all of his boys, you, 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 don't, you didn't hang out with those boys. Maybe for some boys, that works really good. Mm -hmm. And maybe for some, boy, maybe some boys, um, it works really bad. So I always go to people and say, well, who worked for you? Like, like who, what's your manager? What leader touched you? And usually they'll go back and say, you know what? I've, I've had a girl say to me, it was my volleyball coach in high school. Or it was this teacher. Or it was this lady... Uh, ran the choir at church or somebody. I'll say, okay, that's what touched you. So that probably has a lot to do with you. Be that person. And I love the leaders uh, from the grave. Like, I mean, I mean, look at, um, you know, you never talk about religion, sex, politics, but look at Jesus and others. He died 2,000 years ago. Um, I mean, how many people are, are still, what would Jesus do? Um, Gandhi, um, Martin Luther, for me, my dad. My dad's been gone since 1999, and he's still affecting how I think, and, and you know he's still a leader. Mm -hmm. So when you can lead from the grave, man, that that's inspiring when yep. you can lead from the grave. And and these dentists, I mean, I've seen it so many times. They walk in, first thing they do is they walk up to the schedule and goes, "What? what why is my afternoon all open?" It's like, "Well, good morning, doctor." Yeah. You just walk up here and take a crap right on your receptionist's front desk. Right. And now, and now she's going to be answering the phone and greeting patients all day. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. It, and, and the dentists the dentist don't want to learn that. They say, well, that's all the, the I mean, they, they say to my face, they say, well, that's the soft and fuzzy stuff. I want to learn bone grafting. If I, if I could learn how to place implants and bone graft to high predictability, my office will double in cells. It's like, dude. Dude, someday a, ro a robot will make that stuff. Someday art, the Chinese already had the first robot successfully place an implant. You're, you're working with your monkey hands is going to replace like Uber did to a taxi driver. 
It's the leadership stuff that's not going to go away. You know, I, I want to share uh, one exercise that was done in um, one of the courses when I was on campus. Um, we had every everyone in the class had a couple sticky notes on their desk. She didn't say anything while they're there. Uh, the instructions were uh, write down one trait on each of your uh, post-it notes that uh, you feel would uh, define the ideal boss or person that you know you have to work with and um, we all we all did it and then uh, she said okay on that wall I want you guys to put hard skills like smart um, um, highly trained uh, hi highly accomplished uh, lots of experience all, all that goes over there and then over here all the soft skills read it and see what ones you have um, that it's kind generous, uh, fr friendly, uh, trustworthy, all, all of those things. The Boy Scout creed. So there was a massive herd on this side of, of, of us. There were 30 of us in the course, and, and we're all over here trying to put our sticky note on the wall. And there were a couple guys over there put smart, IQ, all that stuff. And, and there were just a handful, and then this whole wall was full. It, it really, really made the point, and I'll never forget that. Uh, the importance of the soft skill. When people meet you um, and they're evaluating you for the first time, they ask themselves two questions. Can I trust this person? Can I respect this person? Uh, and and uh, it's, it's like the saying goes, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You have to... You were have were to, you in Scouts? Uh, when I was a little kid, yeah. Well, well Ryan, well, find me the, the uh, Scouts... Uh, what was it, Scouts Honor? God, I just don't think that. Uh, it was uh, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Isn't that funny that I, I yeah. haven't said that? I, I didn't think, yeah. I haven't said that in a decade or two, but that's, that's the real stuff, isn't it? Yeah. That's what gets people excited to follow you. And I see it all the time where, where hygienists will, will say, uh, they'll post on Dental Town or Hygiene Town, they'll say, well, you know, he's really, really picky on an open margin if he didn't do it. And say so this crown needs to be replaced. Yeah. But then on the six month recall, like, well, th this one's far more open. Oh, it's fine. We'll just watch it. Yeah. And then that now now the staff doesn't believe the treatment. I also think it's another red flag when um, everybody works in the dental office and nobody goes to that dentist. That's a huge red flag. But you bring up a good point with. Yeah, you uh, agree. That's a huge red flag. It's a huge red flag. Just just like the point of not having a long term hygienist. Because hygienists don't stick around and put up with that open margin nonsense where. There's not, so uh, to be an effective leader, you gotta be authentic. You have to have consistency with your words and your actions. You know? um, doing what you say, saying what you do, and, and uh, being consistent and, uh, um, and ethical um, every day, not just sometimes. I mean, what's the definition of integrity? It's doing the right thing when no one's watching. So um, in a situation where you make a mistake, one of the most humbling things that actually is uh, empowering uh, it, it builds your power doesn't it doesn't degrade it is to admit when you're wrong admit mistakes just make it right and learn from it and uh, if if you can do that uh, in front of your team and own a mistake and I've, I've done it several times uh, it's a level of humility that people just can't resist um, admiring and, and it takes time. You can't just do it once and then you win the whole team. I mean, when they say you buy a practice, don't change anything for a year, uh, I, I agree with that to some extent, but it's not because, oh, you don't know what you're changing, so you need to have a year. It's you need a year to get people to actually trust you. It takes time. Okay, but I, I, know, I know my homies. I know how they think. Mm -hmm. They think, well, I don't care if none of the staff stay, and I don't care if the patients don't come back. I'm going to get an A in marketing and advertising and SEO and website and Google AdWords and Facebook ads, and I'm going to tweet and Twitter my way to success by just getting a bunch of new patients every month. Um, what I would say to that is um, I don't advertise. I you don't, don't advertise. I don't market. I've got a website. That's it. And what is your website, uh, Ryan? It's uh, to me. ScottsdaleSmile.com for Scottsdale Smile. Scottsdale Smile. Scottsdale Smile. So you don't. So you only have a website. I have a website. So why why do you not advertise? I don't advertise because our patients do it for us. 
Um, the majority of our new patients are from internal word of mouth referrals. And uh, that is, to me, classic sign that you're doing something right. So how many dentists are there? Are you, are you the owner? Or are you a partner? Or? I'm owner. But you have associates, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, I've got two, two associates, both of whom were uh, prior owners of the practice and just uh, worked back. Jonathan Combs. Yep. Jonathan and, Combs and Don Chiapetti. And is Don Chiapetti, is he Italian or Syrian? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> so you agree then? I mean, what, what I see is I see the cottage industries where nobody has more than 1% of the market by definition, cottage industry. I mean, there's 125,000 dental offices and the biggest chain, um, Harlan owns 800. So they'd have to grow another 50% to have 1% of the dental offices. Um, they, those small cottage, they always want new patients. But to get to a billion dollar company, the Fortune 500, they all have loyalty programs. They're all like, um, you know, who hasn't flown Southwest or seen a uh, Chase credit card? Right. They try to keep customers for life. Mm -hmm. And the dentists, you know, they, even in their vocabulary, they say, well, you know, we have a really great new patient experience. Well, what about the existing patient experience? Right. Well, how, why would there be a difference between new and existing? Right. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's kind of that amateur cottage industry that thinks of new patients and new patient experience when this should all be, the owners should all be on loyalty. I think a high new patient count is a sign of weakness. It means that you're, you're dependent on that and the marketing budget to make that happen in order to, uh, to get the revenue levels that you're experiencing. So what is your, um, what percent of revenue are you spending on marketing? I thought you might ask, so I brought my, uh, marketing 0.63 percent. Nine. And what was? And what do you think the average DSO is? Maybe four. Four. Three or four. Depends. It depends. Yeah. Some of them market a lot heavier than others. Um, but again, it's, it's. This is this is the point I want to make to everyone watching that uh, listening that is thinking about how they're going to compete with the DSO. Um, don't. Um, let them flood everyone's mailboxes with all of these flyers that give away dentistry. Uh, don't, don't participate. There's one thing I learned in the program that uh, there's red ocean strategy and blue ocean strategy. The red ocean, it's red for a reason, red blood. It's uh, cutthroat and you get in that ocean and you fight it out with everyone. Or you can go, go into the blue ocean, which is um, uncontested market. Um, you're not fighting over these people that um, I would argue you may not want in your practice anyways. They're not loyal. They're Groupon shoppers. They, they jump around from place to place. And um, it, it's on us uh, as a profession to resist the, the temptation to try to compete with that part of the market. Uh, we, we need to be very careful because if we do that, uh, we diminish the value of what we provide as, as dentists, uh, and that's, that's what happened to the physicians. And that's why um, the consolidation of the uh, physicians that uh, happened many years ago um, resulted in the uh, low reimbursement rates for a lot of physicians now. Uh, and uh, the same could be said for the effects on uh, trust. If, if you have... Um, people coming into these corporations that may not be the most ethical or they may not um, be honest and fair. Um, the perception in the public is that that is tied to the dentist. They don't care that it's, it's a dentist and they look at dentists. So we need to be careful as a profession to preserve the trust and people trust dentists. They do and we want to keep it that way. And the value and the services that we provide when you do free exam, free x-ray, free this, free that, and all, all that stuff, you're focusing on price instead of value. There's a very big difference between price and value. DSOs, in my view, focus on price. It's a number. It's not in context of any of the other factors surrounding the experience. And, and value is, okay, it costs what it costs, but you get a personalized experience. You don't have a revolving door of dentists and team members. We have A players, not B and C players in the practice. Um, we use um, the top materials, we use the best labs, and we have the time to sit down and talk with the patients about um, their, their personal life, and we don't have to run and do three hygiene checks 
and, and um, you know, do a filling in between coming back and taking an impression for a crown. That's the life that I lived for um, five years working corporate and, and having to jump around and uh, almost burn myself out and um, you know, did, did a number on my back. The dentists need to watch out for that too. It's not sustainable. Uh, to work under those kinds of conditions. So. You, you dropped, uh, we're, we, uh, we passed our hour, we passed, we're in overtime. Oh. This is so interesting, but I want to go back. You, you dropped a, a term red ocean, uh, blue ocean. Will, will you go back and explain, because that might have flown over someone's head. Yeah. What, what's the difference between a red so, ocean and a blue ocean strategy? So you've got red ocean. Um, think of, so there's something called uh, Porter's Five Forces, and it, it describes how uh, in, in business you have different levels of threats from coming from different directions. One is a new entrant to the market, someone that is this coming This is Porter's in, Five Forces? Porter's Five Forces. Someone's so coming, number one is new, a new entrant? New entrant coming in and trying to uh, get some of the market share. And then you've got your uh, customers that put pressure on you. Um, for low cost or um, um, you know in, increased value, you've got your suppliers that can put pressure on you, um, which is an interesting situation um, because of the class action uh, with some of the supply companies. Henry but, Schein, Patterson, and Benko. And I think Burkhart got let out of it, but. But uh, yeah, you think they got let out of it, or they weren't involved? Oh, they were involved, but they were dismissed from being part of the. How do you, how do you, why do you think they got dismissed? Uh, well, the uh, a rep I know here in town tells me because they weren't participating in any uh, collusion um, or price fixing or, or any antitrust type issues. You think and the other three were? It depends on how you define it. I think that there's a lot of funny business that goes on in a lot of industries, and whether this one is uh, substantially different from any of the other stuff that. Flies well, I've the seen radar. some very cringeable stuff. Like I know there was this uh, little bitty guy that sells supplies online, and he took out a booth in Arizona and Texas. So the big three said, no, that guy's not coming. If he comes, we're not showing up. Mm -hmm. I said, are you kidding me? And, and the executive directors of the dental says, I said, well, we're, we don't play like that. So this little guy went and got one little booth and then these major empty space, you went to the conventions like, why is that all empty? Oh, that was the big boys. And that's bullying. Yeah. And There's the attorney of general of Texas, uh, the, the dental, um, the state dental society turned over to the attorney general of Texas, and then our guy here turned over to the attorney general of Texas, and that looks like that. Is that a big part of that suit? Yeah, it's a huge part of it, and it's, yeah. it's price fixing, and, and it's keeping uh, prices artificially high because they and know that they're the only- And it's funny because, um, so they were worried about this little guy selling supplies online. I think it was Source One, wasn't it? Source yes. One? Mm -hmm. Source One, right here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And, um, who cares about Source One? Jeff Bezos mm -hmm. had a booth at the New York, um, the Greater New York Dental Meeting last November. I love the Greater New York Dental Meeting because as we're talking right now, it's Chicago Midwinter Meeting. And Greater New York always has it after Thanksgiving and there's Christmas and the weather's perfect and it's the most amazing meeting. I'm getting texts from my team all day long they're in Chicago. It's 12 degrees. I'm freezing. It's miserable. You know, it's like, God. And, and then the same meeting will whine every year why their attendance is falling. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and then when are they going to have the Yankee meeting? You know? Yeah. Well, you know, why, why don't they just move Yankee? They should combine Yankee and Chicago Midwinter and just have it at the North Pole uh, <laughs> every February. Uh, you know, and, uh, but yeah, um, okay. So, yeah, suppliers. So, okay. suppliers. Uh, and then the last one is, uh, well, four. So, so that's threats of substitution. So Substitutes in the marketplace. That's right. And then the, the last one is the obvious one, which is direct competition. Um, that is, if I could make any message known today, it's that we're not in direct competition with DSOs if we choose to exit that red 
the, the red ocean and go into the blue ocean where you don't have, so a classic example. So what's the red ocean? There's blood in the water? Blood Is in that the water, why it's cutthroat, red? whoever has the most marketing, um, flyers in, in the mailboxes, uh, whoever can um, uh, sell the, uh, the product for the lowest price possible, it's, it's competing on, on that level and you're focused on price. You're not focused on value. And you're like group on it's a race to the bottom. They can have them. Yeah. They can, as far as I see it, uh, and and, that, and that's what everyone. If they want to exit the red, go into the blue ocean, uncontested market spaces. You're going after um, um, a market that no one is uh, trying to take away from you. Now, of course, there are other people in in that ocean, and so it's not truly uncontested. But on a relative term, it is. Um, you're 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 not going to win if you go after. You're not going to win. And that's why to. I never rolled out a DSO for the last 30 years because, yeah, I could go out there and get an A on demographics, the location, the advertising, the equipment. I could do all that. But I always thought at the end of the day, the dentist is a product. That's right. I know this is an iPhone. I know this is a bottle of water. But when I walk in and meet you and you tell me you have four cavities, you're no different than my engine light coming on. And I go to the same uh, auto guy since I bought my car in 2004 from the same guy when he was single. Then he had, got married. Then he had a kid. Now he's up to like three kids. I believe and trust him when he says, I got to do this. And then the schedule maintenance stuff, you know, he'll tell me, well, I mean, I wouldn't do it. I mean, you know, who, yeah. who does that? Um, it, it's the product is the dentist. That's right. And, it, it's, and are you creating an atmosphere? Of empathy, sympathy, trust. Oh, I got to read the deal. Um, I uh, come on. I got to read the uh, the um, a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. I think I got all those. That's uh, impressive, uh, right? That's good. But that's what it is. And and how are you trustworthy when every time I come in here, it's a different dental assistant and it's a different dental hygienist mm -hmm. and it's turnover and there's all these, and, and I'm getting all these mailing pieces in my mailbox, like you're my dentist, I mean, um, and then, yeah. We've found in our practice that people are willing to pay a little bit more to not have to deal with all that and to come in and to have a, a true dental home and faces aren't changing and they know, we know them by name yeah. They, they come in and we don't have to say, oh, uh, who are you? Uh, and who are you here to see? We know who they are. And you know what? You know what? You know what I would pay just for a cardiovascular uh, um, surgeon, a cardiologist. I mean, you know how sad this is. I mean, you see all this research that on five-year, ten-year mortality rates, stents versus non-stents, no difference. Statins versus no statins. So I, you know, so I figure, okay, I'm 55, I'm fat, I'm bald, I, you know, I got four grandkids. I should go really get this thing checked out. You know what my friends tell me? Well, you know, I don't know who I could send you to because if you walked in there, they just, I guarantee you, if 10 people went in there, 10 would get stents. I'm like, really? Yeah. So you're, you're in the hood here for 30 years and you don't know who you could send me to? They go, no. I mean, I know if, you, if I send you to, to this one place that we all know, shit, they're going to they're gonna do a bypass on you. And, and so yeah. I, I think the market is warming up. I, I think the millennials are gonna be very different. And the way I see they're gonna be so different is um, in religion. The, the, um, the baby boomers, um, you know, the, like the Ten Commandments, the first three, one God, honor me, this day is holy. The next one's honor parents. It's kind of a blind obedience. Well, you're the doctor. I mean, I've been a dentist 30 years, all the older people. Well, you know, you're the doctor if that's what you think. Well, you're the doctor. Now the millennials are like, well, let me do a 15 minute Google search on this. Yeah. And, uh, and they're more, they're not, um, they're not orthodox religion. They're, they're spiritual. They're like, I know there's something bigger than me, but I don't believe you. I don't think, I think you can eat shellfish. And you know, I mean, I'm not gonna get all caught up in these rules, which my mom and sisters are obsessed with. I mean, they, they read the Bible like a lawyer is reading the constitution. And I think that the millennials are gonna be far more loyal to themselves than blind obedient to God and country. You, you also see it in, in the surveys around the world, like what percent of their uh, children are willing to go to war and die for their country. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a chart from 1950 to 2018, it's just plummeting down. Some of those countries are down to only 11% would die for their country. 
And a lot of them are wise enough saying, well, you know, you're the politician. Why, why don't you go die for the country? You know, I noticed, I noticed the guys that start all the wars, none of their kids are in the war. You know, so I, I, th I think it's going to be a very highly more educated market. And they're going to realize you get what you pay for. My iPhone costs more than a Samsung. If you gave me $1,000 cash and a free Samsung, I'd give them both back to you. Right. I, I don't want it. That's right. And I, and I would pay a cardiologist cash, dinero, if he would just sit down and say, well, here's the pros and cons of everything and what he would do on his own mom. I don't want him to be the average American hospital. When I was in MBA school, there were hospital administrators there saying, dude, we lose money on almost everything we do. We, but we get up, you know, I'll get like $40 for an exam, but I get $100,000 for a bypass. I get like $80,000 for a mastectomy. I get 50000 for a hip. I can't treat I can't do all these exams and consultations. We have to do big surgeries. And if our hospital does three to four big surgeries a day, bypass, colonoscopy, mastectomy, hips, if we do three or four big ones every single day, we pay our bills. But we take those four things away, we're, we're, we're losing across the board. And that is, just, that is just so wrong. The hospital... The way it's set up, they can't make a living telling grandma, well, here's your pros and cons. Let me spend 20 minutes with you. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. They, they don't no. make money doing that. No. The, 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 the Medicare, Medicaid, insurance system in America is only, you only make money um, doing acute dentistry. Like, how many dental offices lose money on cleanings, exams, x-rays, and fillings? But they don't care because if they get a couple crowns, a couple molar root canals, and do a partial denture or place an implant, they, they all make money. Well, they should be making money on every action they do. There should be, you shouldn't have to sit there and say, well, my hygiene department loses 200 a day, but if I, instead of doing an MOD direct filling and do a crown, I'll, we'll, I'll make it up. Right. So the incentives are horrible. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the saying this reminds me of is, uh, charge what you're worth or you'll be worth what you charge. Yeah. Yeah, so. And, and Touch me that, Ryan. I want to remember that. Charge what you're worth or you'll be worth what you charge. charge. Yeah. Because if you only get paid $78 to do a filling, well, you're going to do a $78 filling. But if you do the filling like the, the way you would do it in any of your kids, right. um, then and then you need 178 or 278 to make that work, then, then that's what you got to do. And it goes beyond that. In the first case, you become associated with doing $78 fillings. Your yeah. name and your reputation is not linked to quality and all the other good things that come with the. So what? So what's your goal? You're just a baby. You're 32. Is your what? What is your goal? Do you um you you gonna where, where do you see yourself in 10 years, 20 years, or when you're as old as me and a grandpa and have four grandkids? Yeah, um, 10 years. Uh, I, I see myself still practicing dentistry. Maybe not owning um, Scottsdale Smile Center. Um, it's it's uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding, but um, the size of the practice makes it so that I'm not um, as available for my family as I'd like to be. Uh, so I, I'd like to. Uh, so you're married with guys. You're wondering. You're married with kids. Yeah, we've got a little baby girl. She's seven months old. Oh wow. Yeah. So. Um, well, those, I, you know, I'm, I got to tell the truth. You know, you can still put her up for adoption at seven months, <laughs> but once not they get about two years old. Then it's gonna at the end of the day cost you half a million dollars. So I yeah. just want you to know. Right now you could probably make forty five thousand dollars on the deal. But you <laughs> keep, keep her for twelve more months and she's gonna cost you half a million. Yeah. Uh, just teasing. Yeah. But uh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so I I, I wanna be a dentist for many years to come, well beyond the ten years, but um, maybe balance it a little bit more with uh, family life and, and uh, that's where I see myself. Um, it'd be interesting. Family first, business Fam second. Family, and that's how we uh, run it at the office, too. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. see that hypocrisy where the dentist, uh, three times a day they come in there, oh, your wife's on line two. And then the assistant gets in trouble because her husband calls or the school calls, and they say, you know, no personal phone calls. I ax that rule right out of the gate. I Because I, I hired an old office manager, and that was her rule. Yeah. I said, well, she's not going to be able to assist me during a filling if she's wondering who the hell is calling or if the school or their baby's sick or yeah how could you i mean um well i like that um show uh um 
Pawn Stars. Yep. That with that bald guy kind of yeah. looks like me. Uh, pawn, pawn, and with that's just saying, you know, family first, business second. That's right. Yeah. And and anything that there's no reason not to have a policy like that. Anything that you think you're going to lose by having your hygienist um, off for a day because your kid is sick, she's going to appreciate you and your oh, leadership yeah. and the gesture so much. You will make that money back ten times over in no time flat. So. And well, if you just if you can just uh, I'm I believe uh, I, I call it the longer lease theory. And um, I, you know you know who taught me that? You're never going to believe that. It was a Federal Reserve study. And they did one of the biggest studies on um, employee turnover in business, and because they, they own more economists. I mean, I, I think I think what three thousand PhD economists work for the Fed, so they're always trying to you know they want what's best for the economy. And they ran this deal, and they said um, they were comparing they were they were comparing how bonuses in sales deals get them focused so much on making the sale. They stopped paying attention to all the periphery things. And what they saw that actually increased the most profit was the longest leash. So let's say that I say, you have to work for me eight to five. Everybody has to work eight to five. But if I wanted to drop off my daughter to school, I drop her off at 8.15, I could be there at 8.30. But that, that's not, that's your black and white rule. Everybody has to be here at eight. So she always comes to work resentful. And that someone else had to take it, you know, her whole life. When the other two girls, they didn't even have a kid in school. You know, a quarter of baby boomers didn't have a kid. I noticed in my office, either um, three out of four have kids, and one out of four have furry friends, dogs, yeah. cats, whatever. And um, and I've had so many people stay with me 20 years or longer, and they and what they usually point back to the most, I'll say a little why. Because you assume it's because I'm tall, dark, and handsome, and, and all that stuff, and they say, you know, it was, it was the flexibility, it was... Uh, Letting me work from home, it was, um, you know, um, it was, because you know here in Phoenix, some people want to get here at six, because if they had to be here at eight, they'd be an hour in traffic. Mm -hmm. But if they came at seven, they have 15 minutes of traffic. Some people have to leave at 3.30 or they're gonna sit an hour in traffic. You know, so, yeah. so not having these one size fits all. You know, they used to say with the king, you know, the king's writ, W-R-I-T, dot the I's and cross the T. Because he would see a writ and if you did this, you know, you were killed. And all these people are getting killed that had nothing to do with the king's writ. That it was about the king's writ and say, you should write it better. You should write it more clearly. And you don't want to be the king's writ. You don't want to have an HR policy and dot the I's cross the T's. You want, to, you want to keep customers for life. And you're not going to do that unless you keep patients for life. Right. And if they don't walk in there and see someone, and even if you have staff turnover, it's one thing if you have staff turnover amongst a background of people who've been there 15, 20 years. That's very different mm -hmm. than when you walk into a DSO and it's a, it's a revolt. The whole place is, is flipped in two years. Yep. Yep, you got to do things that make their lives easy, as I said earlier. We've got a policy where uh, we've got unlimited sick days. Unlimited sick days. We call them personal days. Unlimited. I think Google does that. But how is a small small business, a dental practice, how, how do we do that? Well, we've got a culture where people wouldn't think of abusing that. And, and um, if someone's sick for two weeks, I don't want them coming to the office because they're not going to be productive. They're going to get other people sick. Most importantly, they're going to get the patient sick, and they don't want that. So if someone's sick for two weeks, but they've only got a week of sick pay, then what do you do? Yeah, you remember, Ryan, when my son was working for a restaurant, we shouted out a name, and he said, well, I'm really, really sick with the flu, and he's a cook. And they're like, I don't care. Come in anyway. Remember that? And it's like, uh, okay, so this is the guy handling all the food, and he's telling you he has the flu. Not a cold, but he has the flu. Mm -hmm. And your first thoughts is, I don't care, come in anyway. It's like, uh, and uh, yeah, so he and me don't eat there anymore. Yeah. Cause, uh, but hey, yeah. man, we were supposed to do an hour. You did an hour and 21. Wow. Um, seriously, man, you're wise beyond your years. Well, uh, which goes to show you, you can get some easy experience. A lot of people go work at DSOs and they say, oh, it's horrible, it's horrible. You know, for, after two years, I finally got out of there. And I'll say, okay, well, you work for this company that owns like 100 offices. Tell me all the management stuff you learned. Oh, I didn't learn any. Oh, so you just had a bad attitude. So these things you didn't like, you didn't realize that there's not many people that can even own 100 offices. So you can bad mouth it all day long, but they got skill sets you don't have. I mean, how many dentists in the United States 
At what percent of Dennis United States could get to the level of owning 100 offices? Maybe a quarter of a percent. I know. So, so really, you work for Rick Workman that owns 800. You didn't learn a thing. You worked for uh, Stephen Thorne at Pacific. You didn't learn a business thing. You work for Rick Kirshner who owns 350 comfort dollars. Really? Really? You could just say you didn't like it because of ABC. I, I tell kids, my God, go work for Heartland. Steal all their owner's manuals, the HRs, all the forms, all the systems. Yep. Every day you go to lunch, go to lunch with your office manager. And then see if she can get you lunch with the district manager. And after you worked there two or three years, you kind of did a residency, you kind of did a dental MBA of a corporation that effectively runs 800 offices. They, they, there's, now is it perfect? No, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect. Yeah. But hey, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. For, for coming by and talking to my homies, that was yeah, awesome. Appreciate it, thank you.